Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, The Blackbird Academy, Avid, Isotope, Recording Connection, Studio 202, The Slate Companies, and Audio Technica. This week's guest will attempt to help you make a living plus protect your business. If he messes up, he will personally answer to me. Get ready for the Pensado Capital Jam in Washington, D.C. Details coming up. We are locked and loaded. We've got a brand new ITL. Let it roll. You're at the place, baby. It's Pensado's place. Man, so glad you guys are hanging out with us today. we got a lot of stuff for you, some new things, and uh, a real special interview for me. Mm -hmm. I hope it's going to be special for you it when is. you're done. It is, because I owe you so much. You've been on me for five years, <laughs> uh, so we hope we can... Well, you know, her, but I, I, before we get into the show, this is just a something from you and me. Mm -hmm. You've done so much for me, and, and you've taught me so much, and, and I, I, I just want people to see the, the breadth and width and depth of your intellect. Oh, cool, and so man. hopefully they'll get a feel for that. Today. And vice versa. And how much how, how much uh, intellectual knowledge you have about this process. And, and vice versa. We, we have grown together. Shall we get on with Let's it? Do it? Hi to each and every one of you. It is great to be here. You know our gang, Vintage King, The Blackbird Academy, Audio Technica, Avid, Isotope, Recording Connection, and Studio 202 all making this possible. Vintage King doing some good stuff. They've been going around the country recording great content, including some with the Master Blaster here, Dave. Watch their site for that. The Blackbird Academy is promoting their upcoming classes. If you want to learn and get a job, it's a good thing. International students, this means you as well. You can reach karma at theblackbirdacademy.com. Ask about that sick drum plug-in line that, we, that we've been talking That's about, amazing. that folks are raving about. Um, all good stuff. Likes and subscribes, that's part of our fuel. Thanks for your efforts. If you could keep that up, Dave, and I thank you much for that. And right now, I want you to pull out your calendars. Go ahead. I'll wait. Good. Ah, ah, ah. You right there in the UK. Pull it out. There you go. All right. Mark this down. Saturday, April 18th, from 1 to 4 in Washington, D.C., the Pensado Capital Jam is coming, and we are going to take over that place. Dave and I are bringing in the whole team. We're going to bring some of our awesome friends to hang with you and help you out if we can. <clears throat> you want some names? How about this? DJ Ali from Kendrick Lamar, an absolute beast. Yes. Ann Mincielli from the incredible Jungle City Studios in New York. Ann has engineered Pharrell's Grammy nominated album, did Amazing Spider-Man 2 with Hans Zimmer, Alicia Keys, Emily Sande, and so much more. Want a mastering genius? How about Gavin Lurson? T-Bone Burnett, Miranda Lambert, Roseanne Cash, Pharrell. His projects have won Grammys, Oscars, Golden Globes, and on and on. Um, this next guy, <clears throat> why don't we just go two words? Young Guru? Oh, man, Guru's my guy. Enough said. He'll be there. And Dave and I are working on a couple of more. You know, there's never just enough for us, right? Like, <laughs> right? We're working on a few? Yeah. You've got some calls in, my friend. Yeah, also, too, you can't go to New York and slight somebody, so we had to get... Uh, yeah, there's a, a New York God, yeah, right? So yeah. we're talking to a New York God that we can't commit to this week, hopefully yeah. by next week. Yeah. But here is your... If we are doing a scavenger hunt, here are your clues. <laughs> he did Coldplay. Yeah. He did John Mayer. Yeah. He's had recent Grammys in the Latin space. He is an absolute legend, yeah, right? Yeah. We're going to get him. If i got to go up and drive and yeah. bring him down, we're going to get no. him. Yeah, much love. <clears throat> we'll let you know shortly. And, you know, that's just never enough for us. We're going to give away gear, prizes. We're going to set up a couple of lucky folks with internships. Rumor has it we might give away a couple of portable recording studios for a few lucky folks. There will be music, food, and a whole bunch of fun. Be there. Go to pensadosplace.tv forward slash capital jam, put in your email, let us know where you're from, and you're good. Once again, pensadosplace.tv forward slash capital jam, get your behinds there. Dave and I have not come to the East Coast. We're way overdue. We want to see you. And by the way, ladies, this means you too. A lot for you to learn, a lot for you to learn from a lot of guys and a lot of ladies. We want to see you there. Plenty to observe, plenty to help your careers plenty to grow from, 
we are aren't you excited about this i am actually I, it's just amazing um this is being put on in conjunction with the washington dc naris chapter wendy cherry there it has been a phenomenal co-host with us also studio 202 so all you grammy guys that are part of that chapter want to see you there you'll be able to go to grammy pro to their site and sign up really shortly um it's going to be a ball we'll hammer it out over the next few weeks first come first serve be there it's going to be a ball um i think you have an an, an itl this week you have well, yeah my friend marek from better maker introduced me to a new plug-in company called melba productions and i found a little jewel hidden in their uh in their bundle and i and i'm using it on vocals i i really love it i use this on a current record i just worked on this i just did i want to share this with you What's up, everybody? Glad you could come by today. Um, I got an interesting ITL for you. At least I think it's interesting. Almost every song we do has background vocals. And I want to show you a slightly different approach and a couple of different things you might not have tried before. Uh, this is a background vocal on uh, the artist Peaches. Uh, I've got it soloed, and this is the final result. Now, I'm going to take off some of the stuff that I did to it, um, and, 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 I, and I want you to kind of, I'm, I'm going to take mostly just the effects off. And this is, this is without, the, without the main things I want to show you. Feel free, feel free. So, so I, I, I muted basically three effects. Now, um, This effect is 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 uh, uh, nectar two. Um, I can't remember what the preset was, but uh, not a lot going on. I got a little EQ, a little compression, a little bit of reverb on this one. I'll show you the compression a little slower. I didn't mean to kind of go nuts on you there. So, so this is um, Feel free. this is without Feel it. Free. Okay, here's another part, same thing. Now this is what I like, uh, a little slap, let me show you with and without that. Feel free, feel free, feel free. Just, just a lot of little light lifting. But this is the interesting guy here. Um, I'm, showing, I'm showing you the free version because I wanted you to go get the free version as part of a bundle. The company is called Melda, M-E-L-D-A, Melda Productions, M-E-L-D-A. Uh, cat out of Poland, a friend of Marek, we're going to do an ITL pretty soon uh, on the Better Maker. And uh, uh, Marek is one of the guys that, that exposed me to this early on. Um, this is actually a pitch correction program. But what's unique about this is, is we're not really using it for, for correcting anything. We're using it as an effect. Now, this is without it. I'm going to exaggerate for you. I've got a mix knob here, so. Feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free. Now, let's see what we're doing. This can be a little distracting for me, so I'm, I'm going to show you. We've got several things. We've got depth, we've got speed. Um, those are kind of things that we're accustomed to seeing with uh, tuning programs. But this is the bad boy right here. You can, you can mix the amount of tuning you're doing with the amount of the original signal. This width thing I find pretty interesting. And uh, to me, this is what caught my ear. Now, I was over at Pro Tools Expert. You guys know that I love Pro Tools Expert. Russ Hughes and the guys, um, I, I go there at least five times a week. And I saw, I, I pulled up an old video about a year old that Russ was using this plug-in, and I was like, oh man, that's so incredible. So Russ shows you some things that I'm not showing you. Go check his video out too. It's, everything he does is excellent over there at Pro Tools. So um, protoolsexpert.com, and it has hyphens in between pro and tool, so. Um, 
Let's go through some of these things. Feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free. Just play with these parameters. I like it right in there. It's a little it's, Feel free. for this type of part. It kind of adds something because this this is this part is a, we're not a ballad or or something. So um, if you were doing a ballad, you you want to get a little more subtle. Now this song is in um, um, C sharp minor. So let's see. I probably should have had this on C sharp the whole time. So even even I make dumb mistakes. Um. Feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free, feel free. Cool. Got to try it out. They make a lot of things. It's very affordable plugins. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Um, let me know if, if you discover something else uh, with any of their plugins. I'd love to know. They, they've got so many, I'm going to need your help in going through them all. But everything I've tried is um, pretty amazing. Okay, next time. Hey, guys. I've got a show for you that was five years in the making, so today is a special day at Pensado's place. And like any special day, you have to have a very ultra special guest, once in a lifetime guest. We're lacking. <laughs> We're lacking. My friend and younger brother, Herb Trowick, is hey. our guest today. Herbert? Hey guys, how are you? I get the handshake yeah, in so order, you know. Uh, our audience, so many people have been wanting to um, pick your brain about so many things. At the live events, you can feel it, right? Right, right, right. I mean, really, both of them. Knowing, knowing, knowing how to make a record, knowing what to do, that's all great till you have to sell it. And so, it's a, bit of a, a lot of people want to know right. the industry part, and nobody knows that better than you, my friend. So, when you first started, uh, when you first knew you wanted to be a manager back in high school, mm -hmm. explain to them, <laughs> explain to them how young Lord Herbert mm -hmm. exhibited signs of greatness back even as a young teenager. That's a great story. Well, I, I don't know that I. By did. the way, it's in our book, Gonzalo's Papers. Oh right, I'm trying to gotta, remember the lie. <laughs> you got you to amplify it here. I don't know. The, here's the funny thing, which is the ironic truth. When I was in college, I wanted to be an engineer. No. And I wanted to be an engineer because I had a, a college radio show, and and the way that I was sort of popular and got girls and all that kind of stuff was always to have the newest music. Oh. So I had this incredible stereo and all this kind of stuff, and I was a DJ on the college radio station. Anyways, long and short of it was, I thought, I always intended to come to LA, and I thought if I was an engineer, I would get the music first, and I would be ahead. So I just really had a college perspective on how to get to music first and then once I got to LA and things turned out the way they did um, working at a record company sort of made sense and that started the journey the manager thing didn't come till way after the record executive thing uh, I actually didn't ever want to be a manager and people sort of forced me to it but you were going back to my question sure. you dodged it like a politician like a for some reason sure <laughs> um, you you won. I don't. I've never heard of anyone getting a scholarship to a major university <laughs> as a manager. Well, it's a different kind of manager. I was really a ball boy. Yeah, but that's managing because you did like events. <laughs> well, well, I I had a coach who's seminal, a coach named Steve Gilmore, um, and, the, and to not bore the audience, but he just gave me a lot of responsibility. And we went to a school that was fairly well to do. It was funded by an oil company. Um, I had moved from Canada to Kentucky, was a little bit of a lost guy, and um, was a football player. And um, he said, you know, you should think about this. And I was like, I'm not going to be a water boy. And he said, well, you know what, we have a program, we have a budget, we have, which turned into me taking that. And by the time I was a junior, 
I had a staff of four or five, <laughs> a budget of X. How many lawyers at the time? <laughs> uh, I, was, I was starting to talk to them, and literally by my senior year, I had five scholarship offers to go to college as a manager, that's and that's how I went to college. Once you became, once you knew that you wanted to be a manager, who were some people that you looked up to and possibly patterned some of the things you do now after? Big influences early. Um, probably the largest is David Geffen. Um, okay. I. I carried everything by David Geffen, every article, every book, for years when I was a young executive. I got to be friends with people at the label so I could go hang out there with Gary Gersh and Eddie Gilreath and a whole bunch of people who were part of the legendary Geffen team. Um, never spent any time with David, but, but watched how um, thinking outside the box, force of nature, willpower, um, could result in things. You have to remember this is a guy that by the time he was 30 was chairman of Warner Brothers Pictures even though he was a record guy. Incredible. And so yeah I mean he's really an incredible story. Um, and then there were others along the way that you just can't help. Um, Barry Gordy's story was seminal for me. A guy that people may not know who people in the record business know. Clarence Avant, oh, yeah. the godfather. Um, I'm very close with his children and him and his wife Jackie. Um, who else? Um, well, you speak about Dick Griffey a lot. Well, so I had these influences coming up that um, inspired me to get in the business. And then there were guys who aren't as famous. Um, I hung out and started dating this incredible lady uh, who worked at a pop FM station, KNX FM. And that musical director took me under his wing. And I just was stunned that you could get free records. <laughs> so I was just like, free records? And he taught me the business and introduced me to record people. So moving forward, um, I worked myself into a job at a company called, well, I did part-time stuff. I worked at the LA Times and then a, a half the day and then half the day I worked for RCA Records as a temporary employee. And I would just sit outside and pack 12 inches and send them to clubs and all that kind of stuff. What? Um, yeah, 12 inches. I was packing 12 inches. <laughs> okay, just wanted to hear you records. say it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wishful thought. Um, and that is the journey that I often tell people that if you can find the 2015 version of that, you're going to learn the fundamentals. Yeah. As it moved forward, a dear friend of mine who's now on our board, uh, Virgil Roberts, took pity on me um, and hired me at a company called Solar Records, which stood for Sound of Los Angeles Records. And I got, and this was a blessing, um, they will never find their place in the story of pop culture, but it was really an amazing story. And the short version of it is, um, he was a male nurse who had an incredible eye and um, and put together a company where we were forced to act like entrepreneurs who were inside a company. So way back when it was unheard of, we had a movie division, we had a touring division, we took the Jacksons out on tour in conjunction with Robert Kraft, who now is the New England Patriots. He unionized concert promoters. Um, some of the big guys who are now big in the industry um, started with Dick. Um, Al Heyman, who's now Floyd Mayweather's major guy in boxing. Mm -hmm. Al came out of Harvard, and his thesis was, was concert promotion. Um, he came up for a time underneath Dick. Um, the first stuff that Dr. Dre and stuff did before they went to Interscope, they brought that to Dick. Jimmy and Terry did their first records with Dick before they went on. Um, Ellie and Babyface came out of that camp, on and on and on and on. And so all the entrepreneurs were sort of forced to have divisions and think and think outside the box and bring it back in. Very unusual place. That was pretty forward thinking. Back in the day, um, Electra gave him enough money to build a tower in, in LA that is now where Atlantic has their recording studios. Hollywood was nothing then. Dick had the vision of Virgil to build that. There's actually a, a picture of all of us breaking ground, and there's nothing else around us in Hollywood. He would have seminars where he would bring in the head of MTV, the head of WIA uh, distribution stuff, and all the executives would have to just go learn for two or three days. And then he even got us involved in managing a presidential campaign for Jesse Jackson. Mm -hmm. We spoke at the United Nations. He just forced us to not think like record people and then bring that back to record stuff. And we sold a lot of records. So we had kind of Pop Urban Act, Shallow Mar, Midnight Star, Whispers, Lakeside, stuff like that. Um, and that's where the learning process went. And so I came up with executives like L.A. Reid and the guy that went on and managed In Vogue, and I went on to manage Brian McKnight and 
the lady that did the Tupac Shakur Oscar nominated stuff, and you didn't know it at the time, but then you look back and go, wow. And also, to be fair, it was a place that taught us, you know, how to throw elbows if you need to throw elbows. So that was, Dick was very seminal, and a lot of us who are currently in the business who learned it from him sort of manage our process like him. When, from, from, the, from the perspective of a manager, when do you think someone needs a manager? And when do they not need a manager? Differs in each case. Differs by the conditions of the business. So, 10 years ago I would have managed, I would have answered that one way. Today I would manage it a different way. And the other thing that matters is what you do. Do you need a manager as an artist? Do you need a manager as an engineer? Do you need a manager as a producer? Mm -hmm. Do you need a manager as a digital media person? Those are different things. And, and oftentimes, which my management brethren hate, I often advise people not to have a manager. Oftentimes. Depends on who you are. If you have a really good assistant and somebody will take care of some business, you can get pretty far down the pike before you have to get in that situation. Today, managers have to make a decision um, that is both career and economic. Does this person have a career and can I make a realistic living? Can we make a realistic living together? There's nothing worse than three or four years of chasing something that doesn't happen. It's bad for both parties. So many people think that if I, I get this question all the time, and I know you get it tenfold, if I just get a manager, I'll be successful. Right, like, not true. They, like they think if they find the right manager, mm -hmm. that that manager's going to suddenly supply them with work, mm -hmm. guide their career. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's, it's, it's not that simple. Um, you got to have something to manage, right? You have to have something to manage. You have to, it, it even goes, it's a geographical question. It, the reality of it is in California, it's against the law for managers to get you work. It's not the same on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, out here, there's a statute, really agents can get you work, managers can't. Um, and managers can open up a door, but if they're not bringing anything to walk through the door, their calls will their calls will stop being received. That door will shut. So it's a matter of the right time for the creative person and the right manager who understands that at that time. Uh, it's not an automatic process. Now, when it works, mm -hmm. it can be amazing. Yeah. I've seen you over the years. We've been together on 25 years or yeah. so, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you elect not to manage a lot of people, way yeah. more than you take on. Yeah. Um, it, it, is it, can everybody be managed or are there some people that are unmanageable? Yeah, there are. From and, your perspective. And there's some managers who shouldn't be managing. Mm -hmm. it, it's both sides. It, it's, you know, you hear all the cliche stuff. It's like a marriage and all, it's a relationship. Um, if the connective tissue is bad in the beginning, it's going to end up fraying and eventually breaking. And you sometimes can be making a lot of money or having a lot of success together, yeah. but that actually adds more pressure. So I'm not, I'm not trying to make it negative. I'm saying it's a delicate balance. Um, you have to sort of be careful. You have to understand what kind of manager you need. Managers have different strengths and styles, just like artists do. I'm going to get back to the management. Uh, part of you in a moment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to appeal to the intellectual part. Uh -oh. uh, give, me some opinion, give me some opinions. Uh, I've heard you uh, talk about these multiple times about uh, in, in today's climate, mm -hmm. how, how do you monetize your skills mm -hmm. and how do you manage a manager that's managing you in terms of of making an income from what we do. There's a little bit of turmoil. turmoil. I think it's going to fix itself. What's your opinion? What are you, are you talking about as an engineer or producer? Or uh, yeah, engineer producer. On the engineer producer side, I think, I think the engineering side in particular is in the process. A lot of people don't want to admit this out loud. But the reality of it is, is there's a pressure to flatten out what, they, what companies pay engineers and they do it a number of ways they do engineer shootouts they want you mm -hmm. to do something for free and then they'll decide and they'll mm -hmm. determine what they'll pay you um, so if you're in the very 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 top tier you know where you are and Manny or and a whole bunch of others mm -hmm. um, there's certain leeway that you have but even you guys are facing certain kind of pressures oh, yeah, sure. and, and a lot of folks don't like to talk about it um, the other issue with that is that if you are completely dependent on your career and you look at your career as funded and resourced by record companies, you're making your box this small. And I, as you know, tend to think that you got to look big. I mean, here's a fact. There is no place on the planet where there is an audio. No place. There's no place that's silent. Mm -hmm. That means your career is unlimited. Mm 
-hmm. But you have to think about it that way. Yeah. There's and now with technology, you can be anywhere and it, and approach any place. But if you're just going to do four major record companies and however many indies, and that's a worthy pursuit. But that's your box is really small. There's so many. You can do audio in the military. You can do audio in medicine. You can do audio in digital media. You can do audio in animal science. You can. There's so many places you can apply audio skills that, by the way, value you more because you come with an expertise they can't find. And so I'm not suggesting anti-record company. I'm a pro-record company guy. We've come out of that mm -hmm. thing. We understand it. It's gone through a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to that rubric of there's no place on the planet that there is an audio, mm -hmm. which means if you yeah, think that Yeah, that kind of changed way, my life when you told, told me that. It's a big thing. Look how it changed our lives. Mm -hmm. So I think on the engineer side, um, it's important at the right time. You, you look at the camp of the stuff. You see the genres that they deal with. You sit with people and look at them face to face. You, you, you utilize your instinct. You utilize your intellect and your instinct. There's a gut feeling when you sit with somebody yeah. who has a connection. Yeah, Listen to that. Listen to that. Uh, by the way, shout out and thanks to our Facebook followers on Pensada's Place. Absolutely. You guys had some great questions. Love uh, the Ralph Lauren stuff. I agree. <laughs> We've talked about it for five years. Ralph Lauren, pay attention. I probably have 200 polo shirts and I'm loyal to you. They should be coming in the mail for free. So. <laughs> uh, one person wanted to know the importance of contacts, but I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit. Okay. Uh, a manager has to have contacts, that's a given. Mm -hmm. Someone that's, that's just starting out, how do they get contacts? How do they, a lot of people want to know just that first step, like, like they've got some skills, how, how do they get into the industry in terms of, do they have to meet people, do they have to go sneak into to functions? Is, is, there's no shortcut really. Well, what you're, let me answer it a different way, okay. which is, That's um, so. <laughs> no, no, it's a great question. <laughs> um, part of the art of art is the ability to learn how to network. Mm -hmm. And that's a skill. It's also a science. So there are certain people, let's use Chong Gore out of our show. Okay. So Chong Gore, when we were taping, when we used to tape in Santa Monica, literally <laughs> every moment yeah. would be sitting with you. Yeah. And I couldn't stand him. And I was like, why is this guy? Always sitting with Dave. But let's let's expand that. He didn't sit with me. He sat with our guest. Uh, he, the guest would walk in, and and Chango, there's a sudden expression <laughs> for the way he attached himself no to him. No question. And that's what he did. <laughs> that's what he did. And then, but it went farther than that. Then I would come see you at the studio for a meeting, open the door, and there's Chango sitting in the studio with you. Yeah. Now that has turned into, you know, he is one of my all-time yeah, favorites, good cat, good cat. and he's got a huge future. But what he was doing was learning, kind of in a brusque way how to network. Chongo wanted to be in the conversation, wanted to learn, so on and so forth. There are different ways you do it, but if you don't have the wherewithal to figure out how to get to somebody in a way where they'll spend five minutes with you, you'll say something valuable, you'll walk away and follow up, some of it's just good etiquette. So if you reach yeah. out to me and then you reach back to me in a way that impresses me, I'm going to reach back to you and have a conversation and I'm going to remember you. The whole science of networking for people who want to be managers, and I think anything in media mm. is an important thing. It's, and you can do it if you're uncomfortable social, if you are a big personality. You can define it so it works for you, but to stay unknown and invisible is a very dangerous thing in today's environment, in an environment where everybody shares. Would you be my guest all the time? Okay. You're the best guest I've ever had. I just talk quick. That's all. <laughs> uh, another question on Facebook from our viewers was, um, want, want to know how social media has affected your job. Ooh. Let's expand that into how has social media affected their jobs right. in terms of getting where they want to be. If you can give me an A-B answer. Uh, it's um, one of the most amazing phenomena. So in our career path, uh -huh. um, we saw the advent of a number of things. Um, CDs, right? Then MP3s, went from DATs and ADATs, went from consoles to in the box. We've seen a lot of things. So here comes social media. And the reality of social media, it just reflects what we're all living, which is a complete digital paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. It's affected all of our lives. So you have a choice. You can either ignore it, and have a very sort of superficial relationship with it, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You can subsume yourself with it and have it become part of the tool of your 
um, you know, your holster of business tools, right? Mm -hmm. I think that you have to make yourself aware of it and go past just sharing. See, social media can have you busy with no result. Mm -hmm. And you're just busy. And you look up and you kind of go to bed empty and yeah, I got more likes, I got more, what happens with that? If you have a goal that you're gonna get to and it's gonna help your creativity, it's gonna help your professional career, it's going to help your economics, it's gonna help your social standing, you have to know about it because the other side is that it can be dangerous. If you misuse it, if it's a problem, if you, you make a mistake. Do you advocate sometimes not using uh, the internet, but just a telephone call? Well, I do. I, um, you know, you see me do that all the time yeah. with, our, with our team. Because sometimes you just, look, you're going to be better if you understand human-to-human -human interaction. You just are. Now, why wouldn't you add that to your skill set if that's not what you're used to doing? It doesn't mean you do it all the time, but... We just had an example where we needed a chip for the camera, right? <laughs> yeah. And if we had just done social media, we might have sent the person out to go get it to the wrong places because we just didn't call to say, do you have it? That seems pretty basic to me. That's not that complicated. And it took four seconds and you become more sure. Beyond that, we're losing the art of interacting like this. And in, and in anything that connects people, you can't just be technical. You can be technical plus plus. Mm -hmm. You have to have technical stuff, but you can't just be technical. Because when it fails, the guy that's going to hire you to mix a record, the guy that's going to hire you or sign you to a record deal, mm -hmm. they don't just do it off of a file. They sit with you. They want to know your skill set. They want to know how you communicate. I'm not going to put my artist in your hands if you don't know how to communicate with them. If you were 20 years old, didn't know anyone, you're coming from a, uh, the middle of the country, with your intellect, what would you do to to contact a producer or an a and r likely stay at home likely stay at home because I, I think there's a couple theories um i think you can be a big fish in a small pond oh okay i wasn't was following you there i get it now and and once you're a big fish in a small pond you have transferable skills mm -hmm. that are different technology allows you to be any place now or like you and i did some people like the game so we came to LA to get in the game, yeah, we see people yeah. in New York, but the game's different. So I see a lot of people come now and they can't get any water, but they're making a lot of contacts, but it doesn't turn into a career. So the way that your drive has to be, the way you have to be single-mindedly focused, the way you have to shift if things don't happen, is something you can only pick up with experience. So you just have to make a determination about your intestinal fortitude, mm -hmm and the career marketplace and what you're going to go do. And because when you burn out and it doesn't happen, it can be debilitating. Um, and and I guess you're describing my career path, because I, I, I knew I wasn't good enough to compete out here, and I, at, at, the <laughs> time, at, 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 at the time I started, okay. I, I was really bad. Wow. But um, uh, I had to pay people to really work for them, I was so bad. <laughs> But I learned in a, in a small market at the time, it's since grown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and um, you, you guys, I hope you're paying attention to this. For you guys that are a little more advanced, I got a question for her for you. You, you often maintain that uh, one of the greatest sources of, I don't know the, I don't know quite the right noun, but you, you advocate the use of attorneys a lot mm -hmm. in, 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 as part of your entire mm -hmm. uh, managerial skill set. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Well, I, I think, one of the things that managers want to stay close to is deal flow. Because deal flow is the intersection where things are going to turn into something or not. Mm -hmm. And the more you're part of that conversation, the more you can do, you have information for your client, information that can keep him from trouble or benefit him or her, um, be beneficial for them, be an advantage. And the other thing that happens is there's, there's no, Hollywood is full of transactions. I, I shouldn't say Hollywood, um, media and entertainment are full of transactions. So at some point in time, the fundamental elements are going to be in some agreement. It might be your mix agreement with the label, it might be your recording contract, it might be a touring contract, it might be a contract between me and a manager, as a manager and a client. Eventually there's some transactions. Transactions detail your breakup. They don't detail how you get together. Oh, I, didn't, I never knew that. Yeah, so there's all these definers and here's how we're going to behave in this, and here's what happens if there's trouble, and here's what's going to happen. And, 
And so when you know that since most, almost every deal requires an attorney, it never hurts in your networking, in my opinion, to know attorneys. Now that's my style. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of manager style. If you've been in it a long time, you end up knowing a lot of attorneys because you've done a lot of transactions. Other managers may have other styles that are completely mm -hmm. important. I've seen it work. Works pretty for, well. For you and I. It's worked for Pensado's place. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and, and to be candid, mm -hmm. um, we've gone through, as you know, um, lawyers that we thought weren't as effective, mm -hmm. and we have landed on lawyers who are super effective. Yeah. And the super effective ones have changed things for us with two phone calls. Yeah. Literally. And by the way, uh -huh. it's not that expensive. That's the other thing that scares people. It's relatively expensive. Though. Well, it, it depends on your relationship. Yeah. So anyway. Well, well, a lot of attorneys that, that we've met out here, I don't want to name names, but I know there are a few that will take a, an entry level person and, and, and help move them up the food chain. No question. Um, they don't have business if they would do that. That's so. true. Well, I didn't know that was true. Yeah. I, I spoke before I heard the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> they can get other business, but you're constantly having yeah. to replenish your talent. Branding is a big buzz, buzzword these days. Mm -hmm. No one's more gifted than you at, at marketing and branding. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, they are, but that's no story. No, you do it masterfully because you, I'm the recipient of, recipient of that. Even before I knew what it was 20 years ago, you mm -hmm. branded me, and, and people hard drive. <laughs> and when people um, had a, a myriad of options to choose from in terms of who to hire, somehow they thought of me, and, and that's the result of some of the work you did. Um, Let's, let's do a two-part question, Herb. Okay. How does branding relate to a guy starting out? Mm -hmm. a, you know, social media is not necessarily branding. Mm -hmm. And how does the branding relate to a guy that's kind of already moved up the food chain a little bit? Um, I think branding can be a trap um, because you can brand yourself, but it doesn't necessarily have an economic construct. So if you're oh, branded okay. as an ass, <laughs> or if your brand is a guy who does everything in a t-shirt. insinuating anything. No, right? not about Okay, it. good. Not or if you're branded as a guy who always wears his cap backwards, or if you're branded as something, can that translate into, well, sometimes because you're known for something, mm -hmm. but it's going to come back down to your work. Gotcha. And at, at some point in time, if your work is attached to a style or a brand, then it's easier to then determine how to monetize that. So on the way up, I would say get good. In but, fact, get when you're saying brand in that in that definition, I still don't fully understand branding. But when you when you use it like you just did, are, are you talking about the same way that that if we think a hamburger, we think uh, a quarter pounder or a, a whopper or something? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that I know that was a stupid question. No, but I think I understand what you mean. So, brand is something you identify with that is that denotes who you are. But it should be something that makes someone want to hire you, right? Well, I think your work makes somebody want to hire you. I think that your brand may work toward how they want to affiliate with you. So in other words, okay. I could hire you and though I, I never see you, yeah. but then I could hire you and have you in all my pictures and so forth so because we have similar beliefs and philosophies. Uh -huh. But when you move that up the ladder and you get to, at least for engineers, guys like you and other folks that are in your, your genre, you know, you and presenters, Producers, artists, any other kinds of things, even executives now. Executives have been doing branding of themselves, particularly on the business side, for 10, 15 years. It has a lot to do with what you stand for. It has a lot to do with how the companies that you may work with, what they stand for. It has to be sort of a consistent philosophy. Um, if you represent yourself one way and then you flip and represent, what you're going to do is just lose people because you seem inauthentic. Mm -hmm. um, it's important on some levels, but it's unimportant if you're not good. Gotcha. Nobody's going to brand somebody that's bad. I, uh, I, I, I agree 100%. Sense. Herb, um, you said something to me a while back that, that made a profound impact on me, and I'd like for you to kind of expand on it for our audience. You mm -hmm. said, well, Dave, the reason that the, this is happening is because you, you, you teach people how to treat you. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I'm, I'm, that was profound. Mm. Expand on that concept, because I think that could be the most important thing we convey to them now. Well, I think that if you're not being treated the way that you want to be in certain circumstances, it's because of what you're giving off. Gotcha. And, and that doesn't make you a bad person. It's not about being perfect. I am far from it. With all the platitudes that you give me, I am far from perfect. 
um, you know how much you know our relationship is important to us how much of a badass I think you are Thank and you. I still get involved with how we shape and do mm -hmm. things and get better mm -hmm. so I, I think that for, can I use an example with you sure okay so when whisper it first okay 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 cool um, but she didn't really do that. Well, that's not what she told me. Okay, good. But it messed up your brand. <laughs> <laughs> I have a brand? You do. You do. Like, oh, boy, do you ever have a brand? Like, like the Circle H Rants? Is that kind what's of, branded it's on? It's double P's, baby. Okay. It's always place. Um, one of the things about you as a person is that you are a giver and a philosopher. Mm -hmm. But also part of what, when I got back involved with you six years ago, whatever, mm -hmm. and I'm we started 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to shift a little bit was the notion of pleasing people at your expense. Yeah, I, I, did, uh, I didn't want to change you pleasing people, just not at your expense. Mm -hmm. Because there's too many people who literally, because you opened the door, they didn't even think they were taking advantage of you. Mm -hmm. They were saying, hey, Dave, Dave's so cool. He'll mm -hmm. mix my stuff for free, and he'll do it by this afternoon. <laughs> and you would end up with loaded mm -hmm. up stuff, mm -hmm. not being able to get it all done and people then asking questions and see that converts to them being unhappy at some point in time because you made yeah. promises. Plus I over promised and under delivered. <laughs> so <laughs> under promise over deliver is what so you should the, do. So my job I think was to as your friend say how can we make this shift without you feeling bad about it and then secondly show you how that shift was hurting you time wise and economically and a way that you could maintain being Dave but also change the way you taught people how to treat you. And I think we've sort of successfully done that and we've done it gently because, again, you're the one who's creating the recipient of what you get back. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, you know, if. Well, I can tell the audience that that made a big difference in my life. So, you know, the notion that it changed your life, it mm -hmm. changed my life, that the people who taught me that, changed, and hopefully it, it, it changed. It doesn't mean go be a bad person, it just means that you are going to define how people respond to you by how you behave. And if you want respect and honor and income and other kinds of things, check out your game plan, check out how you come off and, and learn from others. You know, success is about copying. Mm -hmm. you, you find successful people and then you'd see what they do and kind of go, mm -hmm. let me figure out my version of that. I do that all the time. And uh, every successful person does. And ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately you'll find that there's a way and a manner of dealing with people that generally want, makes them want to deal with you. Um, the newsworthy stuff are sometimes the outsized personalities that, that cause a lot of controversy. That ain't the way to get there. Sometimes when I introduce you as my manager, I feel a little weird because you're so much more than, a, mm -hmm. than my manager. In fact, that's the smallest responsibility you have. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sitting here making a list of the big responsibilities, psychologist, preacher, doctor, accountant, lawyer, <laughs> guidance counselor, best friend. So Black uh, how do you look at yourself? How do you view, you, do you view, view yourself as a manager? I actually don't. Um, I, well, I view myself as a guy who had a pretty good run as a manager, who understands management. I think management is a proud profession, but very, unknown, the managers who are beasts in the business, and when, and when I think about managers, I don't think about managers just in the music business. There's managers in the talent space, there's managers in the sports space, and more and more our skill sets are intersecting. So very few managers manage one thing, manage one thing and that's what's happened with Pensado's Place. So, you know, if I use you as an example, and the discussions we had in year one about interviewing, and the way you approach it now, it's it, it's 180 degrees because we learned why it was important and you know your skill set now I watch your preparation I watch the response we get from stuff and it's one of the proudest things I do is now sit back and watch Dave interview you know I used to have my hands on it yeah. it's about you though <laughs> well 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 here's the thing so now in terms of being flexible which is important to our audience. So as an executive producer and somebody who knows how now to get digital media up, you know, we just came from a meeting mm -hmm. about um, our site and stuff and delved in deeper than we ever was like being at a Google meeting. Um, I have to do campaigns for advertisers and keep those people happy. Um, I have to manage a team. When we do the award show, um, you hit me with the idea of an award show and pretty much from there I said, let me run and conferred with you. I wrote it. 
picked music, we named categories, I ran the rehearsal. I'm not saying all that because I'm so cool. You, know, you, only, you only listed about 2% of what you actually <laughs> did too. Well, I'm sort of constructed to balance out a lot of things, mm -hmm. but I'm also really, really nuanced about yeah. making sure we deliver for them. It is critical to me. You There's an orifice that actually describes the way you are quite accurately. It, Nuanced, it, we'll it, go with that for now. It ends with hole. <laughs> <laughs> Starts with donkey. <laughs> in fact, there's multiple things you could attach in front of the hole part That's true. to describe uh, I, I try to be in war mode. Well, when I'm in war mode, that is absolutely true. Yeah. Um, because the other part is, um, in our game, you learn that sometimes you have to throw elbows. It's not pleasant. Um, it's uncomfortable sometimes, but I am a fierce protector of our brand. We built it. It stands for something. I'm proud of it. Um, I want them to be happy 99% of the time, and then the other 99%, which is 200% or almost 200%, I want our sponsors to say that's why we're with them. So you know we will kill for people because we believe that much in it. We're being rewarded for doing it. And I think the proof is in the pudding. If it wasn't working, why would I continue it? We've had an amazing four-year run. So now my hats are so many different hats. I'm in so many different conversations <laughs> with media people and media companies and do you want to program this television station channel and stuff that we couldn't <laughs> even, or authors, or stuff. So I, so here's a really point about You birthed about the that. baby the other day too. I, I birthed it and then actually was able to send it back. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so, but here's the it point. It was kind of ugly. It was. Um, if I didn't mean you had the baby. I mean, like no, a, I a midwife. No, I birthed yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah. Thought it was ugly, put it back. Yeah, good. Um, the key is you have to evolve. And there's enough information out there for you to learn. And that's one of the things, the elements about Penwick Media, which is our company that we co own, that owns mm -hmm. the show, that I'm so proud of. We got it's an engineer it. and a manager who now have a digital media show that is global that we put up content, we have not missed a beat in mm -hmm. 200 plus episodes. Our fans really like us, we, we work really serious. hard. Oh, hell yeah we do. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 this, this is the ugly part of her. Yeah, we're gonna, we gonna get it done, we get it done <laughs> every week because I'm so, it's just because I'm so proud of it. Let, let me ask you a Herb question. Sure, man. You, you, you said earlier about, you know, uh, kind of intimated about, you know, why you are a manager. I was just—I was thinking last night when I was putting putting my thoughts together, and gamblers are addicted to the big win. Yeah. You know, they 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 live for the big win. Yeah. In Herville, what is the big win for you? What is that one thing that that, that you're gonna go? Oh, you know, just like you just won two hundred, three hundred grand at a or a million. That's a really good question. Um, I think. Hope this isn't complicated. It's different in different silos. So mm -hmm. if you come to our live events, mm -hmm. right, I have a need to have the live event feel a certain way to you. Mm -hmm. And I am just psychotic about it. And you are gracious enough to go with the rest of our team. But we have seen really big results from yeah. that kind of nuance yeah. of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And it's important to me that there's a certain kind of impact and there's a certain kind of response. For our show, that manifests itself differently. Mm -hmm. Execution of the television side, the guesting, how we can improve it, mm -hmm. style, you know. Um, and so the big wins for me are, some are creative, in terms of how we talk to audience and reach to them. Look, I'm a businessman, and what I want for Penwick and for us and for our team is success on a commercial level as well too, and you know I'm pretty, hell bent on that because we've earned it not not because we deserve it it's because we've earned it um it is fueled by competition yeah and if there even if there isn't competition i'll sort of make it up um i like alpha people um so you know alpha males alpha females I can take from them and learn and then put in my style. I watched a Kobe documentary the other day, and I know Kobe can incite lots of different opinions, but if you live in L.A. and you've gotten to know him a little, and we just barely know him. He's been using one of my videos earlier. In the most recent documentary, he said he spent time, not documentary, interview with Ahmad Rashad, 
watching when the ball went in the net, how the net shaped around the ball, and at what degree the ball would drop out. And it adjusted his jump shot so the ball would either slow down in terms of dropping out or coming out faster. Now I will tell you that the people that I follow all think about that level of detail. Pick your idiom. I watch you mix. Uh, all of our fans who mix. All of our friends who've been on this thing mix. What astounds me about you guys and you guys is the level of detail and nuance that will shift something from being smoking mm -hmm. to nothing, from emotional to nothing, to celebratory to nothing. You know, I call Manny the nuclear option. Mm -hmm. If you want shit to blow up, call mm -hmm. Manny. Mm -hmm. Manny can, if you take a Bruno Mars song that Manny has done, there are more colors and shit going mm -hmm. on in that one song. Mm -hmm. And Manny takes you on a ride that you don't know that you're on. I, when people ask me about you, I say, nobody that I know has the ability to take multiple genres and make them pop friendly for radio mm -hmm. without compromising the genre that they're from. Mm -hmm. That's that that's Kobe yes, pal. And you know, you you're you're look, but you give me a lot of credit. This is about you though. Yeah, but, but part of part of my ability as a manager is to recognize great talent. That's really the manager's job. That's part of it. I can at a hundred paces go winner, winner, no, 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 winner. Weird. You learn it over time, mm -hmm. you don't have it automatically. So all those things that we got signed, when we got Robin Thicke signed, Brian mm -hmm. Ryan, when mm -hmm. I got Tyree signed, when I had the label deals, mm -hmm. I've had a number of them. I've been a consultant to a number of record companies. I've done stuff on Broadway. Now we've got this digital media show, which by the way, out of all the other stuff I've done, by far this is the most proud thing we've done because we're sitting at the w edge of a wave. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my point is, is that if you take the nuance and the detail, there's no difference in what we do. You mix records, and I mix Penwick Media. Mm -hmm. This is my studio. In fact, that's an 816 console. <laughs> it's done by the McDougal family out of Ireland. It's very special, yeah. the 816. Yeah. Um, but the point of it is, is that I'm mixing nuanced details in our business. You, you like a chess match, too. And you know what? I hate chess. <laughs> it's just too slow. <laughs> so the other thing I have to have That's is I got to go at my rhythm. Yeah. And the where you're and you really, do have a rhythm when you're working. Well, you also allow me to be unfettered. Mm -hmm. See, that's why our partnership works. Mm -hmm. You're like, I tell you all the time, just strap on. It'll be a little bit turbulent, but we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> and you do it. But I also know that I have that blessing, mm -hmm. and that is an example of a manager-client relationship. I think so. That is really works well. Mm -hmm. And I would rather run north on the southbound freeway than mess that up. So I have to have your trust and we'll be able to do it. I need a favor from you. Yes, sir, brother. Um, normally, this is the spot in the show where I tie everything with a neat little bow. I don't have a clue. Can you <laughs> me take it home for me, buddy? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> by and large, um, we're here for you. And I think that um, hopefully this has been helpful for you. Dave wants to do this you know, once a quarter, so on and so forth. Yeah. So if we didn't get it all in now, we'll get more in. Um, know that you're in a business that is very wide. So if you're looking at it very narrow, oh, expand your lens, it widen out. Um, it's also become more and more important to people. So I recently <clears throat> saw a guy that owns the New Republic magazine, and he, he was one of the founders of Facebook. Chris, I forget what his last name is. And he was talking about how to bring the magazine into the future. And half of what he talked about was video and audio. Wow. Now, that might be your job. And that job may pay you more than being a recording engineer. So your options are unlimited. Okay. Dave and I weren't digital media people. We weren't talking about having a show. This is a marvelous time. Take advantage of it. Widen up the iris. Stay with us. We love you. Hopefully this was helpful. We'll do it some more. And for guys like Dave and I to be this excited means that you should be thrilled. And <laughs> so I hope this was fun. Man, Did we cover uh, it fun. I'm a, this is going to be the only show I've watched of ours. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I, 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 I fast forward my parts and just watch the guests. Well, I just, I <laughs> but, but this time I might watch the whole thing. Well, cool. I love you. Love you too, bud. Thanks. Hey, guys. Last time I have.